Hi and hello from Boston, Massachusetts. Oliver Freudenreich or Dr. F here for the Psychopharmacology Institute. In this quick take today, we're going to look together at an important aspect of care for people with schizophrenia, reducing their premature mortality. More specifically, does it make a difference if we use long-acting injectable antipsychotics versus oral antipsychotics? To help us answer this question, we are going to look at a meta-analysis published in August of 2024 by Claudia Imerich. Apologies to Claudia if I butchered your name in molecular psychiatry. But first, let me start with some clinical background that you may already know, but that deserves repeating here. Antipsychotics are very effective in preventing a psychotic relapse in patients with schizophrenia. Their effect size is big. You may know the so-called number needed to treat, or NNT, to capture effect sizes. The NNT is three for antipsychotics for relapse prevention, which is comparable to many treatments that we routinely use in medicine. However, there is the vexing clinical problem of non-adherence to oral antipsychotics, which can lead to unstable illness course with numerous relapses and only partial recovery, which comes at a cost. I call this cost psychosocial toxicity. Examples are time spent in inpatient units instead of going to school, losing a job, losing your reputation, or legal problems. And sorry for being so dramatic, but another psychosocial toxicity is death due to unstable illness. Death can be the result of suicide, accidents, or due to poorly treated medical illness, which I think is often not appreciated enough. There is no medical health without psychiatric health. It is difficult to manage your diabetes, for example, when you are psychotic. And as a result, patients with schizophrenia on average have a reduced life expectancy of 15 to 20 years. Numerous studies have shown that the worst outcome, by the way, is in untreated psychiatric patients, despite some morbidity and mortality from our psychiatric treatments like antipsychotics. Psychiatric treatment really prevents death. Over the last decades, there have been numerous studies that have shown that long-acting injectable antipsychotics reduce relapse compared to oral antipsychotics. You may now wonder if this should not result in improved mortality. You see the logic, right? Antipsychotics, when reliably taken, prevent relapse, which reduces mortality. A treatment that is reliably taken, like a long-acting injectable antipsychotic, should be better than a treatment that is only occasionally taken, such as an oral antipsychotic. This current study summarizes a lot of this literature for us in the form of a meta-analysis, but with a focus on the important clinical endpoint of mortality, which I don't think has ever been done before. It also included clinical trials from across the globe, so it should have broad applicability. The study itself is a standard review and meta-analysis with an extensive search for eligible studies that compared oral with long-acting injectable antipsychotics in patients with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. In addition, studies were only included if there was data on all-cause mortality, meaning that the number of deaths in each study group was reported. The authors ended up with 20 studies for the review and 17 for the meta-analysis, comprising about 20,000 patients. The majority of studies were randomized controlled trials, so let's trust the review process and the statisticians that they use state-of-the-art statistics, really above my pay grade, to conduct their analysis and just look at the four main findings. One, long-acting injectables reduced all-cause mortality with an odds ratio of 0.79. Two, long-acting injectables reduced non-suicidal mortality, meaning deaths not due to suicide, with an odds ratio of 0.77. Three, Long-acting injectables were not statistically better for preventing deaths from suicide, which may be the result of the difficulties controlling confounding factors in suicidal patients, just as an aside. And finally, four, first episode patients benefited more than chronic patients with regards to mortality reduction. 
One obvious limitation of this analysis is that not all antipsychotics are available as long-acting injectables, and that this study could not examine differences between individual antipsychotics. And finally, most studies in this meta-analysis were done with atypical or second-generation antipsychotics. So, should this study change your clinical practice? I admit that I am a believer in the routine and early use of long-acting injectables, and I think most people who need maintenance antipsychotics would simply be much better off on an LAI compared to an oral antipsychotic including for the purpose of preventing premature death, as shown in this meta-analysis. But, you know, i got to be honest here, despite what some publications say, that you just need to work on your communication skills, and despite my own positive bias towards proposing a long-acting injectable to my patients, it can be an uphill battle, as long-acting injectable antipsychotics are for some patients clearly not their first choice. There may be differences depending on which country you practice in, by the way. So you get a little bit an American view here. I can think of two things that may help lead to a bit of a culture shift with regards to the acceptability of LAIs. First, I think introducing the idea of LAIs as early as possible is critical. Telling patients they are an excellent first choice, at least as good as oral antipsychotics. And not only for people who have shown that oral antipsychotics are not working for them because they're not taken regularly enough. For me, by the way, as early as possible means when you review treatment options with your patient for the first time, that you meet them. So it's not just your first episode patients, any patient that you see for the first time. Some patients will still want to try an oral antipsychotic first or stay on their current oral regimen. And that is okay, as long as you lay the groundwork for a switch to an LAI down the road if necessary. If that person starts with an oral antipsychotic because that is what they selected and it is not working out, you are in a much better position to argue for an LAI since it was already introduced at the beginning of treatment as a good option. And in that way, you avoid the perception that you are now using it punitively because of non-adherence. You basically normalize LAIs and you don't make them special in some way. And second, I also think we need to emphasize the mortality benefit more, not just focusing on side effects in anticipation of pushback against antipsychotic maintenance treatment. Here, you want to make the LAI special. I spoke with an oncologist once who pointed out to me how they would really highlight in oncology the mortality benefit if they had a treatment that improved mortality significantly compared to other treatments. Mind you, this is in our case simply changing from the oral to the long-acting version of the same medication. Inpatient units can play a big role in normalizing LAIs by developing a treatment plan in the hospital that includes LAIs as the basis for long-term stability and specifically starts an LAI prior to discharge. That would also serve the important role of buying some time to connect to outpatient care so the patient does not relapse immediately after discharge. I'm not saying this is always easy to do as there may be issues of insurance coverage and finding a clinic that can give LAIs to your patient. The study highlights the magnified benefit from using LAIs in first episode patients because this is a high risk group for relapse. In one study, 50% of first episode patients, for example, did not even pick up the first prescription for oral antipsychotics after hospital discharge. Adherence is a real issue for young people during this critical illness stage where stability can go a long way towards finishing school and eventually transitioning to work. There are other groups like those people who are violent if they relapse that should be a target. I guess I can say target, not a great word here, but a target of our efforts towards accepting LAIs. Or people who live chaotic lives where taking a daily pill may just be very difficult, like patients who are homeless. Let me make one more comment about some clinical advantages from LAIs, particularly during the early phase of treatment, 
when partial or no adherence is the norm, as I said, not the exception. You basically take the guessing about adherence out of the equation. And you can have an honest discussion based on facts, not mutual suspicions, because it is pretty obvious if somebody missed his injection appointment. Having somebody on LAIs frees up time during their clinical appointment to discuss things other than medication adherence, like recovery goals. Similarly, it also really helps families if their loved one is on an LAI. The family doesn't have to be the nagging adherence police, monitoring daily pill taking, but they can do other important things, like being parents. I believe that injection clinics are effective in part because we follow up when somebody does not come for their injection, since non-adherence is obvious. It forces clinics to provide more accountable care, if you will. I still think it is important to continue to see people regularly, say monthly, even if the injection interval is longer than a month. That's time you can spend on issues of, as I said earlier, of recovery. Here's my clinical bottom line for today. For any person with schizophrenia who needs maintenance treatment for the prevention of a psychotic relapse, I think long-acting injectable antipsychotics should be a first-line option, not a treatment of last resort. LAIs can stabilize an illness course and prevent death from all causes better than oral antipsychotics, most clearly those deaths that are not due to suicide. Thank you for listening to this quick take today.